Good evening. Welcome to Politics and Pros. Uh, can you hear me now? How about now? Good? Okay, fantastic. Uh, my name is Lindsay Lynch. I am a bookseller here. Thank you all for joining us tonight. If you're excited about this event, please let me remind you that we have an amazing roster of upcoming events at this store, along with our locations on the wharf and Union Market. Please feel free to grab a schedule at the info desk or check online to learn more about them. Uh, some ground rules, please silence or turn off your cell phones. You are welcome to keep them out if you want to take pictures. We are also recording this event. Hi, YouTube. So please, when we get to the Q&A, um, speak into the microphones. There are microphones stationed right there and over there. Um, finally, there will be a signing right here after the program. We have Steve Inskeep's book available for purchase at our registers up front. If you could also fold up your chairs and stack them against the walls or a bookcase, uh, that would be a great help to our booksellers. Tonight, I am excited to introduce Steve Inskeep, who will be discussing his book, Imperfect Union, how Jesse and John Fremont mapped the West, invented celebrity, and helped cause the Civil War. Many of you know Steve as a co-host of NPR's Morning Edition, the most widely heard radio station in the United States, along with the NPR podcast, Up First, he is also, also the author of the books Instant City and Jackson Land. In his latest, Steve explores the life of John C. Fremont, one of the United States' leading explorers of the 19th century. But what makes Imperfect Union a great book is Steve's attention to John's wife, Jessie. While many history books make note of Fremont's many discoveries in the American wilderness and his exceptional cataloging of those discoveries, few turn their eye as closely to Jessie Fremont. A senator's daughter, Jessie, was integral as a political advisor to John, along with being a fellow explorer, writer, and editor. Imperfect Union tells the story of John and Jessie as a couple whose joint ambitions and talents intertwined with those of the United States itself. Joining Steve in conversation is Madalika Sika. Madalika has a distinguished career in the world of broadcast journalism, holding roles at NPR, PBS, and ABC News. She is the current executive producer of audio at the Washington Post. Please join me in welcoming them both to Politics and Prose. Good evening. Hello. I know it must have been hard to tear yourself away from the impeachment trial. So thank you very much for coming. We're going to go 14 hours, just so you know. But we forgot to bring our video clip, so oh. we might have to reenact some things. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> My friends Jeff and Ann are here. They will help with the reenactments. Is that okay, guys? Is it good? Okay. Well, let's just dive in. Um, this is a great book. Uh, I don't know how many of you have had a chance to look through it. Uh, but it's a really wonderful, pretty unknown story, actually, I think. Um, and as was pointed out in the introduction, the thing that makes it really fascinating, at least to me, was the fact that not only did Steve look at John Fremont, but he spent a lot of time talking and reading about and telling us about his, uh, John's wife, Jessie. And I was actually looking back at some old texts, and we'd had a text exchange when I had first got the book, and I, I said to Steve, I really like Jessie um, because she's really a fascinating woman. Which uh, is lucky for me because some people really don't like her husband when they start <laughs> reading this. Just goes to show behind every man you need an awesome wife who everybody likes. You can applaud that. That's fine. <laughs> um, so, and there are so many themes in this book that are so relevant for the times we live in. It's quite uh, it's quite eye-opening actually. Today I just started writing down a list of topics in the book, and if you just saw the list of topics except for one, you would think, oh, we're talking about the current world we're living in. Um, so there are lots of lessons from it. But I wanted to start off by, Steve, tell us who John and Jesse were. Oh, absolutely, and I'm delighted to be here and delighted to be talking with you again, Madalika. We worked together closely once upon a time when she was executive producer of 
Morning Edition, and if you like even today what you're hearing on Morning Edition, you should give some credit to this person. Uh, who was it? Yeah, go ahead, go for it. <clears throat> and you should give some credit to my wife, Carol Lee, who is in the front row and has put up with me all of these years. Thank you very much. Like I told you, behind every man. <laughs> Um, John Charles Fremont was one of the most famous men of his time, uh, particularly in the 1840s and 50s, which is when my story is set. Uh, he was not only considered famous, but important. There was a magazine in 1850 that called him one of the world's three most important historical figures since Jesus Christ. He was an explorer. He went out into what was then called the Louisiana Purchase, and he explored the Oregon Trail, which led toward what was called the Oregon Country in the Pacific. He went to California, which at the beginning of our story is actually part of Mexico. But an important thing to know about him is that even though he was an explorer, he did not discover that much that was particularly new. He was mapping trails that were already known, and he was publicizing his adventures. He was coming back east and writing best-selling accounts of his adventures. They would be published as popular books, his reports of his expeditions, and they would be excerpted in newspapers, and they were written in this beautiful literary style that almost made you feel like you were beside John Charles Fremont as he was going over snowy mountains and nearly dying and going over the other side. And in fact, publicity was the point. He was an army officer whose father-in-law, a United States senator, wanted to encourage the United States, uh, Americans, to settle the West, particularly the Oregon country, which was disputed with Britain, and he thought putting settlers there would be the way to take over that land. You had to entice people, and that was Fremont's actual job, was to make the journey westward seem familiar and enticing and more famous. And because he was an ambitious guy, in the process of making the West more famous, he absolutely made himself more famous. He was the center of the story at all times. You mentioned his father-in-law. Yes. Uh, which is a good introduction to his wife. Yeah. Uh, a, a very um, important man uh, who had a daughter who he doted on. And she married someone who then the father embraced. Sounds like a very contemporary story to me. Um, so tell us about yeah. the daughter um, yeah. who became the wife. Uh, everything that I just said about John's accomplishments, particularly the fame part and the publicity part, Jesse was all about. Um, uh, you want me to read a little yes. bit from this? To read us yeah. a little bit about okay. Jesse. Okay, I mentioned the way that John made himself famous. His timing was perfect. Americans were turning to the American West. They were interested in it, and he put himself at the center of that story. But, as I write here, the most important factor in Fremont's fame may have been the person who made it possible for him to take full advantage of both his talent and the times, Jesse Benton Fremont, his wife. Born when women were allowed to make few choices for themselves, Jesse found a way to chart her own course. The daughter of a senator who was deeply involved in the West, she provided her previously unknown husband with entree to the highest levels of the government and media. It was no coincidence that his career began to soar a few months after they eloped when he was 28 and she was 17. There are a lot of older men marrying much younger women in this book, by the way. Just a little trigger warning there. I thought, as many others did, said one of their critics, that Jesse Benton Fremont was the better man of the two. She helped to write his famous reports and some of his letters, serving as secretary, editor, writing partner, and occasional ghostwriter. She amplified his talent for self-promotion, working with news editors to publicize his journeys. She became his political advisor. She attracted talented young men into his circle, promoted friends, and lashed out at enemies. She carried on conversations with senators twice her age, offered her opinion to presidents even when they did not agree with her, and was gradually recognized as a political force in her own right. Her timing was as perfect as her husband's because she was pushing the boundaries of women's assigned roles just as women were beginning to demand a larger place 
in national life. In the 1840s and 50s, women were holding conventions to call for voting rights and also campaigning against slavery. In the 1850s, a new political party was founded, the Republican Party. Its central goal was limiting the expansion of slavery in the United States. They went for a famous, heroic, seeming guy as their nominee, and the person they chose was John Charles Fremont. And when John was nominated for president, Jesse, in 1856, became part of the campaign in ways that no woman ever had. Her husband's campaign literature featured songs of praise for Jesse. They were terrible songs, but they were about Jesse. It almost seemed like they were running for president. Imagine people who presented themselves as a husband and wife team running for, running for president. When could that ever happen in America? <laughs> Women attended campaign rallies even though they could not vote. Thousands of Republicans flocked to the Fremont House in New York City for a glimpse of John on the balcony and then refused to leave until they saw Jesse too. Madam Fremont, they cried. Jesse, give us Jesse. A newspaper said she could have been elected queen. Jesse Benton Fremont achieved a celebrity much like her husband's with fame out of proportion to her accomplishments unless we count her husband's fame among those accomplishments. The thing I love about Jessie is she took full advantage of her position as the daughter of a very yes. powerful and prominent senator, uh, a senator who actually wanted a son but got a daughter and still called the daughter Jessie. Yes, named um, her after his father. <laughs> And she literally sort of, she learned at the feet of her father. She was always at meetings. She, she was around. She sort of absorbed by osmosis. Yeah, it's a remarkable story to me, and I think one that she did not fully tell until the very end of her life. Some of the details I'm about to say are from a memoir that she wrote at the very end. She lived into the 20th century. And she recalled that... Uh, her father not only wanted a boy, but assigned her the role of a boy very nearly when she was young. She wrote, my father gave me early the place that a son would have had. And he took her hunting. Uh, stereotypical boy things in the, in the 19th century. He's out bird hunting and he shoots a bird and puts the dead bird in a bag and she gets to carry the bag and she's excited about carrying the dead bird bag. And she goes with him to the United States Senate and he would put her in the Library of Congress for safekeeping. Um, she followed him to uh, the president's house, what we now call the White House, and met a succession of presidents starting with Andrew Jackson when she was a very small girl. But as she got older, this became challenging for her. As a teenager, this elite teenager going to an elite school and with elite friends, her elite friends began getting married off to much older men. And she attended a wedding at which her maybe 16-year-old friend was married off to the 40-something ambassador from Russia, which she found just gross. The whole thing was overwhelming, and she did not like, like anything about it. And she cut off her hair afterward and went to her father and said, I want to check out of society. I just want to live my life as your assistant. At which point, her father was no longer comfortable with her pretending to be a boy because it was time for her to be a woman, in his opinion. And so things had to change after that. And yet she, in a way, found a way to become his assistant by marrying a man who was destined to assist him because his big goal was settling the West. And let's talk about John and how they connected. And the things that were ultimately said about John, we tend to think that the, the birth of phenomenon is something fairly modern. Uh, shockingly, you can read about a similar phenomenon in this book uh, with regard to John and who he was and how he, he wasn't from the same background and class as she was. No, no, he wasn't uh, at all. He was the illegitimate son of a French immigrant 
and a Virginia aristocrat who left her husband to be with him. She was never able to get a divorce. And of course, this was something that was considered much more of a disgrace at the time than it would be regarded uh, today. Perhaps we'd be more likely just to think of it as an event today. Um, and he had a relatively poor upbringing and pulled himself up gradually, attaching himself to uh, men who became kind of father figures or helpers uh, of his, managed to get into the U.S. Army, uh, but spent most of his life as a relatively untrained amateur. He was an Army officer, for example, who'd never been to West Point. Uh, and had never even spent a lot of time around other soldiers. He would go out in the West and hire civilians for these expeditions. He was an improviser, but he was also ambitious and talented, and she gave him a lot of the connections and status that he needed. After they eloped in 1841, he suddenly had connections to the halls of power. It's really remarkable as they become adults they collectively have an incredible collection of influential people. Um, Francis Preston Blair would be one who's a name who's familiar here. If anybody's ever heard of Blair House across from the White House, that was his home. He was a newspaper man and a counselor to multiple presidents and a close advisor to the Fremonts. But the letters that survive between the Fremonts, plural, and Blair are Jesse's letters back and forth. Uh, and there are even little scenes that she reproduces in the letters where they're sitting by a fire in San Francisco, say, and she's writing a letter, and she calls over to her husband and says, I'm writing Francis. you have anything you want to tell him? And he would say whatever, and she would continue with the letter. But she was the one maintaining the communication. And when he ran for president, she was the one who wrote him and said, I'm sending John to you for advice. And, of course, when he ran for president... Um the opposition tried to make something of the fact that he was a Catholic. Yes. Or his mother was a Catholic. <clears throat> oh, it's, it's, an yeah. amazing, it's, it's an amazing story. Uh, his mother wasn't Catholic. I mean, that's the crazy thing about it. Uh, he was raised Episcopalian. But this was a time uh, of anti-immigrant sentiment, profound anti-immigrant sentiment. Now, I know it is shocking to us today that in this nation of immigrants, that people would be against immigration, and yet somehow it happens from time to time in America. And this was one of those times. There was a movement of nativists. They called themselves often Native Americans, by which they meant native-born white people. They did not mean uh, Indians, as we would with that term. And it was very political. The immigrants tended to vote for one party, the Democratic Party, and so anybody who wasn't a Democrat felt it was unfair that the immigrants were getting to vote. And they had these ideas like, maybe you should make them wait 21 years before they can vote, and, and, and ideas like that. Um, and foreigners should be kept out of office. And they were particularly worried about this dangerous alien religion, Catholicism. And when Fremont ran for president, there was a big question about who was going to get the nativist vote. You wanted to have the nativist vote because there were so many people that hated immigrants, you just needed their votes. And so Fremont's political opponents first revealed that he was the illegitimate son of an immigrant, a fact that his wife had tried to cover up by writing the first chapter of his campaign biography and just making him into a legitimate son of an immigrant. Having revealed him to be the illegitimate son of an immigrant, they then went the next step and turned him into an immigrant, ineligible for the presidency. And then the birthers of 1856 said he was Catholic, which was a profoundly difficult charge to refute because once it's out there, how do you, how do you show anybody what's in your heart? And he was quite upstanding about that. He refused to deny his Catholicism. He refused to deny that he was Catholic. He was not Catholic. Um, but he believed that if you made a statement while running for president, I am not Catholic, you would be admitting that a Catholic should not be president. Right. He couldn't get away with, I am not Catholic, not that there's anything wrong with that. Yes, no. <laughs> Didn't occur to him. Right. They were good wordsmiths, but never got that one across. <laughs> Um, I will confess, I did not grow up in this country, so I did not learn American history the way probably most of you did in um, school. And so I was very fast. No, this is America. We don't know. 
But please, go ahead. I, it's I fine. was so fascinated by the whole expansion to the West, the sort of idea of Manifest Destiny, and also the tussle uh, of the sort of balancing act of we want to expand, but those expansion estates would not be, uh, would not permit slavery. And that was a very real battle uh, for people. Yeah. And I, I think that a lot of people may not understand that, you know, people who were sort of anti-slavery were actually, okay, slavery where we have it right now is fine, but once we expand, that'll be bad. That'll be, we won't have it in these new places. And so, you know, when I think about the, um, John sort of being an abolitionist, I'm like, well, he's not really an abolitionist. Really, he's no. just like, let's not have slavery everywhere else. Could you talk about that? Because I had yeah. no idea about that sort it's of early absolutely, precursor. Absolutely. It's, uh, to me, an incredible story. And part of the reason that it's an incredible story is because I'm a Civil War dork. Are there any Civil War dorks here? I mean, just people who like the Civil War. Yes, <laughs> many hands. Thank you very much. This is about the, cause, uh, the causes of the Civil War. But I'm also a news guy. And to me, it's very much a story about now and very similar to now. We live in this time of tremendous demographic change. Certain groups in the country are growing more rapidly than other groups. People of color, immigrants, other groups we could name. And they tend to vote more often for one party, which becomes a destabilizing thing. Because you then have some Republicans who fear permanently being shut out of power by this demographic change. This is something that the president explicitly campaigned on stopping. One of his slogans at the closing part of his campaign in 2016 was telling his supporters, this is our last chance, our last chance to save the country. And if we don't do it, all of these illegal people are going to come over the border and going to be legalized and be allowed to vote and we'll never win an election again. Explicitly said this. Said the quiet part out loud. You also had Democrats who were confidently expecting this demographic change to bring them victory without trying too hard, which didn't work out very well for them either at that uh, moment in history. You now have Democrats who fear being permanently shut out of power by a president that they see as authoritarian and going way beyond the bounds of the rules, which is why we're in this city where an impeachment trial is going on right now. Now that all relates to the 1840s and 50s because something similar was happening then. The nation was divided. There were northern states and southern states. Northern states that had gradually abolished slavery and southern states that had ever more firmly embraced it. That was the great divide in the country. And there was a demographic change going on. The North had grown much more rapidly in population, which meant increasing political power. And finally, in the 1850s, you had the creation of the Republican Party, which could be an anti-slavery party, not an abolitionist party that was considered an extremist position at the moment, but stopping the spread of slavery with the hope that it might someday go away. They could be an anti-slavery party and have a chance to win election with northern votes alone. They confidently expected victory through that demographic change. Southerners saw this as forever shutting them out of power which they found profoundly threatening. And they said if the Republicans ever won, they would destroy the system. They would secede from the Union. It was deeply destabilizing. And that's a big part of the cause of the Civil War, which is not a reason to say we're about to have a Civil War now or next year or three years from now, but it's something to recognize that is part of the driver. In fact, that's maybe the biggest single driver of the discord and the intensity and the bitterness and the viciousness of our politics. Well, what I found most interesting was that this idea of American expansionism butted up right against anti-slavery. Yes. It's like you might think, yes, America must expand, but oh, no, not you, at the expense you, of... Yeah, you conquer new territory yeah. or you occupy new territory or organize it as a new territory or state. Does it become a free state or a slave state? Does it add to the power of one side or add to the power of the other side? And when I say power, I mean economic power as well as political power and even social or cultural power. For Southern, white Southerners, slavery was, they had made a whole belief system around, around it as to why it was the proper organization of society. And all of that was at stake every time there was a new territory and it created greater and greater tension. And interestingly, Jesse was anti slave yeah. free. I mean, yeah. she 
she refused to have a black maid. Who, well, well or, a, yeah. a sla- an enslaved maid. Yes, yeah. that's true. Uh, her mother uh, came from a slave-owning family in Virginia, but had turned against slavery as a young woman um, and resolved that if she ever inherited slaves, she would free them, and she did that. And the uh, family, Senator Benton's family, and Jesse, by the way, when John married into the family, he just moved in because he was a poor guy. So he moved into the rich people's house. Um, They had servants, but they were free black servants. Um, At the same time, her father, the senator, this man that she idolized, continued to own slaves as he had all his life and used them in various business ventures. Her father, the slave owner, also railed against the dangerous power of slave owners, which is one of the bizarre ironies of the time that people, and I guess when I say people, I mean white people, would have these ridiculously contradictory views of slavery. They would be against it, but for it. They would admit that it was wrong, but own a hundred slaves. They would say that it was wrong and that it should be abolished, but there was nothing really they could do about it. They would say that slavery should end, but they didn't actually want to live next door to a bunch of free black people. And they were speaking as explicitly as I am now, only with worse words. And uh, it's, a, it's a disturbing complexity that makes you wonder, but I want to make a point about it because it again makes me think of now. You wonder how could so many people have recognized, as many people involved in the slave economy did, have recognized that something was morally wrong and, and continued to do it. How could they continue to do it? But then that makes me think about now. What is it we're doing now that a hundred years from now, people might look back and say, how did they understand climate change and continue driving gasoline powered cars? And go ahead, you can applaud that. Um, Or eating beef. Or what are they? (laughs) We could go through various causes, absolutely. Coal fired power plants, we could go on and on. that is one of the things that the study of history brings to me. It constantly makes me think in different, and I hope, mm-hmm. deeper ways about our own time. Um, thinking about slavery and about how each side looked at it and the messages that got back to people, um, we will get to the incident on the Senate floor in a moment. We will oh, get there via a conversation about a topic near and dear to both our hearts as journalists, but the expansion of communication uh, during this period in America and um, most particularly instantaneous communication, and I'm not talking about the president's Twitter feed here, um, but the revolution in instantaneous communication was remarkable and it changed Everything. Yeah, this in in part is the story of the dawn of the communications age that we're living in because Samuel F.B. Morse here in this city uh, developed the telegraph, persuaded Congress to subsidize it, and then ran copper wires from the Supreme Court chamber up to Baltimore, Maryland. And in May of 1844, the Democratic Convention began in Baltimore, and an operator up there is tapping in Morse code, and Morse himself is at the capital end deciphering his own code and reading aloud news updates from the convention to a gathered crowd of eventually hundreds of people. He was the first news anchor, apparently, and uh, very quickly, uh, telegraph wires within a few years connected all the major cities in the eastern part of the United States, at least. And people who witnessed this, newspaper writers who witnessed this, this call, said it, one of them said it was a new species of consciousness. The ability to know with certainty what was going on that very moment in a distant city. I mean, who could imagine the incredible possibilities once you can do that? Um, and it was wondrous in many ways, but it also, this is part of the story, turned out to be disturbing because as the country was divided more and more sharply, 
partisan editors would get simultaneously the same news interpreted in their partisan ways and people would very quickly be shocked at how differently their neighbors viewed the same events. They couldn't believe right. it. Right. I mean, that's what was so interesting in reading about it that, you know, yes, on the one hand, people had access to something that was happening in the moment in another part of the country. But guess what? Filter bubbles existed even then. Yeah. Um, and uh, I love the story of the little altercation on the floor oh. of the United States Senate and how that was um, yeah how that was uh, interpreted across the country um, yeah if you think that it's been kind of uh, bitter the last couple of nights in the United States Senate um, consider this after John C Fremont took part in the conquest of California California sought admission to the Union as a state and the Senate needed to debate whether to allow this or not. And they'd said they wanted to be a free state, so it became a very divisive thing in the way that I've been saying. If a single moment could illustrate the congressional debate over California statehood, it came on April 17, 1850, when Senator Henry Foote of Mississippi prepared to walk into the Senate chamber by tucking a pistol into his suit. It was a Colt revolver available to him thanks to a revolution that was subtly changing American society. Samuel Colt, a Connecticut man, had begun making his patented revolvers in the 1830s, although they were slow to catch on. A revolver that John Fremont himself had fired at an Indian in Oregon in 1846 would have been one of the relatively few in existence. But in the late 1840s, Colt perfected his assembly line production first selling revolvers to the Texas Rangers, and then mass producing a small five-shot weapon for civilian use, the 1849 Colt Pocket. With a barrel as short as three inches, it could be dropped into a man's coat. Colt eventually sold more than 325,000 copies of the pistol as the United States, already an armed society, took a giant leap forward in the power and convenience of its concealed weapons. Foote carried his five-shooter into the Senate because he was debating California statehood and feared a confrontation with an opponent, Senator Thomas Hart Benton, Jesse's father. Now, I won't tell you the whole story, except that I will tell you that Senator Foote would have gone armed to confront Senator Thomas Hart Benton because Benton, as everyone in that time would have known, uh, had fought a number of duels. And on one occasion, as a younger man, he was in, felt insulted by a man, challenged him to a duel. They shot at each other from 30 feet away. Each wounded the other, but then they continued arguing, so they dueled again at 10 paces, and he killed the man. So. Senator Foote brought a revolver into the Senate and ultimately pulled it on the Senate floor, uh, creating a fracas and a criminal, a demand for a criminal investigation as Senator Benton confronted him and was confronted by Senator Foote. That hasn't happened yet in the impeachment trial, <laughs> although we don't know the last half hour, but The you know. Senate floor was a very exciting place during that period. Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, I, w I'm conscious of time, so I want people to start thinking about the questions, and if you want to start making your way to the microphones, uh, we can take some questions, but, um, I want, I do want to ask you, Steve, about, uh... Um, oh, please, go ahead. We can do a lightning round if you want. I'll uh, be short. No, I'm really fascinated by the idea of fame. Mm and how they used it. Now, you've talked about it uh, yeah. a little bit, but I love this, the way you describe Jessie. Jessie understood that her fame could translate to influence, and as the new year began, she used it. And this idea of sort of fame for fame's sake, and that I, I, I think the sort of idea that people could leverage their fame without people, us really understanding, wait, why why is she famous? Yeah. Or why is he famous? Yeah. That is also, it's, it's an old concept. Yes, that's true. And they were brilliant at it. And I argue that they invented a new kind of celebrity, an American sort of celebrity, in that they were not famous for being king or president or a victorious general. They generated their fame 
even as they were doing various things by inflating what they did. John Charles Fremont on one occasion climbed a mountain in the Rocky Mountains, got to the top, planted the American flag. It was sort of like the moonshot and he looked around and decided it must be the highest mountain in all of North America which became a huge part of his fame. Uh, it turned out not to be in the top 100, but it was, was going to be a while before anybody climbed the other 100 mountains to, f to find out. And Jessie understood that she was an ever more prominent woman connected to this very, very famous senator and her very famous husband, and she used that to gain entree. As a young woman in Washington, and even later in life, when uh, her husband was dead and she was broke, she still had her famous name, and she would write letters of introduction for young artists to go meet other famous people. She would use that name all of her life. And she, um, she was quite a source for this newly yes. expanding, burgeoning yeah. news environment yeah. that people lived in. Yeah, her husband would write a letter from somewhere out west and it would read almost like a press release. It's actually a little sad because she would write him love letters and he would write her press releases. <laughs> um, and he would get it back somehow, which was itself an extraordinary challenge because the telegraph wasn't going to California. It would take months for a letter to get back through any kind of weird routes. But if it reached Washington, she would immediately know what to do. She would go to one of the news editors she knew and get it in the paper. And once it was in one paper, it might be reprinted in other papers. And you could, now that there are digital databases of newspapers, you can trace the way that a story goes across the country. Uh, and you can see in depth the way that she participated in making him and ultimately them famous. And the audience wanted it. Oh, yeah, because you know, of the that's, moment. That's yeah. the other half that I think people don't think enough about. Yeah. You know, the audience loved it. They just lapped it up. They were satisfying this need. I mean, a lot of you guys have probably heard of uh, Frederick Jackson Turner's Frontier Thesis, which is from the 1890s. And it was the idea that the American character had been molded by the westward expansion. Um, I discovered, maybe other people's knew, people knew I didn't, that was not an original idea. There's a speech from 1812 that essentially says the same thing. Americans thought that they were making this, that they were, a, white Americans I should say, thought they were a new race of people who were creating this new world and they were the leading edge of the advance of civilization. It was a story that people already told themselves and the Fremont's genius was to grab a hold of that narrative and put themselves at the center of it. Um, that has been true of many of our recent presidents. You be get, get elected president when you say there's this big national narrative and I'm the middle of it. Our current president did that. Our previous president had a different narrative and made himself the face of that narrative. Um, and the Fremonts didn't quite get to the White House but did something very similar. Mm -hmm. And paved the way, f I mean, John's campaign paved the way for Abraham Lincoln. Yes, because they tried to win with northern votes alone. They failed. Um, Fremont lost to James Buchanan, widely regarded as the worst president in history. There's something for your tombstone. I lost to the worst president in history. But the next time around, the same strategy worked against divided opposition. OK, got someone here with a question. You want to say your name and ask you a question? Hi there. Hello. Um, my name is Nathan, and I'm a local college student here in the Washington area. Um, my question is, um, in looking through the book, once, one thing that I found particularly interesting, it, one thing that I found particularly interesting is reading about how, Fre how John C. Fremont during the Civil War abolished slavery in an area under his jurisdiction, yeah. which President Lincoln ultimately overturned, and that, and, and which ultimately, and the episode ultimately led to Fremont's dismissal, and also the episode also led to Jesse meeting with Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. Would you be able to talk some about that? Yeah, it's an amazing story. Uh, it's one of the many great stories about them. My book focuses on the 1840s and 50s, but I do get to that in uh, in an epilogue. And yeah, Fremont was, uh, when the Civil War broke out, Lincoln appointed him a general uh, in Missouri. And Missouri was a mess. And he declared the freedom of the slaves of rebel, of disloyal white citizens. 
Um, Lincoln was not ready to do this. There were still slave states that were part of the Union. He feared losing the war and told Fremont to undo that order and, or modify it in some way, and Fremont declined to do it. He wasn't good at following orders, this man. And ultimately, yeah, instead of following orders, uh, he sent Jesse, or Jesse sent herself, back to Washington to tell Abraham Lincoln what was what. And <laughs> she sends a note uh, saying, I'm here in Washington. Is there a time that would be convenient to see uh, you? And Lincoln sends back a note with one word on it, and the one word is, no. <laughs> she goes over. She starts saying, this emancipation thing, it's really working in Missouri. It also is playing well in Europe where they're against slavery. Finally, we're freeing some slaves. It's going to be a really good deal. And Lincoln said, you are quite a female politician. And she felt that he wasn't listening at all. He felt that he needed to enforce civilian control of the military and ultimately fired her husband. Didn't work. But yeah, it's one of the famous episodes of the Civil War. Yeah, John was trouble. There's also a court martial in the story, too, yeah. that comes along. Hi there. Hi. Oh, oh, ladies and gentlemen, Renee Montaigne of NPR News. <laughs> Here we go, arriving late. <laughs> OK, let's, thank you, thank you. All right, anyway. Go ahead. Hi, my name's Elisa. Um, I'm actually a Capitol tour guide, so I was really excited about Oh, awesome. The the telegraph stuff. Um, I'm also a Missourian, so I've been really excited about your book uh, coming forward. And I'm just wondering uh, more to maybe the process of writing. And I want to know, what's the best thing that you had to cut from the book? Oh, wow. That's going to be hard, because I cut thousands and thousands and thousands of words. Uh, I have an amazing publisher, Anne Godoff. I mean, she is a legend. Ron Chernow is one of her writers. Steve Call is one of her writers. Tom Ricks. I could go on and on. Why she puts up with me, I don't know. Um, but she will do the first edit of my books. And with this one, uh, I'm paraphrasing here slightly, but she said, I really love this book. It uh, is fantastic. It really gets going about 150 pages in. And I thought, that's a long time to expect a reader to wait. And so I substantially cut the earlier chapters. Um, I don't, there were a million asides, but I really just tried to keep things efficient. And maybe a way to put this is that I wanted to keep the focus on these two characters because this, the canvas is so huge. The story is so enormous. There was an early version of this book in which I wanted to have seven main characters. Um, my wise publisher said, I'll let you try to do that, but that is the hardest way ever to write a book. And so I didn't. I cut it down to two. Um, but they're, they're, they are enormously eventful decades in American history. And as we discover from what stays in the book, it reflects now. It is this city. It is, in some cases, the same building. It is the same constitution with a few amendments here and there. And it is the same humanity. You see human nature doing similar things. And all the way through this story, I feel like I'm almost re-experiencing my day job, but seeing it in this kind of dreamlike way where everything is the same and yet also different. Thank you. Thank you. You asked about, I will exert executive privilege here, and you asked about how he does, writes these things. As someone who worked with him when he wrote his first book, I have no friggin' idea. <laughs> I really don't. He's a savant. It's unbelievable. And hosting Morning Edition, which both these fine people did, for, uh, Steve's still doing, and Renee did for many years. Sometimes with Steve's first book, like I'd get a message from him that he'd email me at like 4 a.m. And he said, oh, I read this thing about this thing that happened in India during partition, because his first book was about Karachi. And I'm reading this email. I was like, why is he writing to me at 4 a.m. about this? He should be getting ready for the show. It's really, really remarkable. Um, and I'm in awe of Steve's ability to do this. And he writes cracking good books. So well, thank you. Thank you very much. Next question. Hi. That totally segues right into my question. <laughs> I'm Anjali. I'm a student journalist at UMBC. I'm a big fan of Morning Edition and Up First. Thank you. Um, one of the things that really struck me, I've gotten through part one, um, were all the ane anecdotes about the personalities. Um, and so my question is, how did you 
gather such detailed characterizations in the book of these characters. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, with each of my last couple of books, I have quite deliberately tried to make sure the main characters were people who have a lot of their own words left behind. Um, and a lot of what you read in the early chapters is because they're, they've left their own words, and especially Jesse's own words. Um, Jessie, at the beginning, was helping her husband to write. She didn't write much of anything under her own name, except some letters, of course, as a very young woman. But in 1863, after he'd been fired, actually not once but twice by Abraham Lincoln, she wrote a book defending his conduct. In later years, he blew their money. He had made a huge fortune in California during the gold rush. He lost it all in railroad investments. And she began writing memoirs. It was bad luck for them, but good luck for history and for us, because she began writing articles and memoirs uh, to support them under her own name. And so we got her perspective on events. Um, you still have to add to them, because she was reticent in a sort of, you want, want to say Victorian way, but actually we're all kind of private, even as we're public. I think that's very modern, too. There are things that she leaves out. The epigraph of the book is a sentence from Jessie in which she wrote, it would hardly do to tell the whole truth about everything. And there's an amazing memoir that I recommend to you now. You can order it online through this bookstore, I would imagine, called A Year of American Travel. And she describes going across uh, the country from New York to California. And uh, through much of the book, she is obviously, and she gives little explicit references to being deeply depressed yes. and distressed and out of her mind. She completely leaves out of the story a thing that I discovered when I put together the timeline, which is that days before the story began, uh, one of their children died as an infant. And when you see that key, it unlocks the book, which is not nearly so powerful if you don't know that. And that's one of the things I found very interesting about Jessie and the fact that her, her words are left behind. We talk a lot about people who have been written out of history. They were never actually written in. Um, but she wrote herself in. And the fact that her words still survive, it, that, yeah. you know, that, ent that sort of entree into the idea of, of marriage and distance and children. She was kind of ambivalent about having children and that was pretty public. I yeah. mean, it's a very interesting look at a woman of that time and finding out how she might think, yeah. which I thought was fabulous. Yeah, I really appreciate that. To sir. To yes, sir. To what extent did the Fremonts contribute to the boundaries of the emergency? Oh, well, my goodness. Uh, the border that we're having arguments over now you owe a little bit of the credit to Fremont, who in a rather bumbling way, but ultimately meaningful way, moved into California in 1845-46 with 60 gunmen and began the process of taking it over. And when I say California, Mexican-controlled California was the modern state of California and Nevada and Arizona and parts of some other states, current states, huge territory. And so that act created a new border with Mexico. Um, Fremont uh, was at one point appointed to draw the boundary line itself, but characteristically he accepted the job and then quit and went off to make money instead. Uh, my wife sent me up here to ask who were the other five characters who, who got cut? <laughs> oh my goodness. I, I don't think I have a good answer to that. I'd have to think for a while. I've shoved them I've shoved them absolutely out of my Next mind. Next book. <laughs> Next book. There we go. Right, there my, we go. Lincoln might have been one of them. I, there might, I think there was even a shifting lineup of who the seven characters. There are not enough Lincoln books. I think you should take that out. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's occurred to me. There's only like 15,000, and why not one more? But uh, yeah, maybe so. My follow-up is, are, are we the only two who went to Moorhead State University? Oh, here? all right. Moorhead State University. <laughs> Shake my hand. There we go. Yes, I went to Moorhead State University in Kentucky. Uh, very proud of that. There is, uh, uh, it's, uh, think of it as the Harvard of Rowan County, Kentucky. Um, there is um, 
A memoirist, an excellent writer, Chris Offit. Maybe he's spoken at this store sometime. Chris Offit, wonderful memoirist, uh, went to Moorhead, came back many years later as a teacher, and in his memoir described it as a high school with ashtrays. <laughs> he's less popular in Moorhead than, than he used to be, but, uh, I mean, it was an unusual experience, but I had an amazing experience there, and I think it actually relates to the topic of this book because I think often about diversity and the differences between Americans. Part of my journey in figuring that out is my colleague here because we had to think about diversity all the time on who got on Morning Edition and who worked at Morning Edition and everything else. Um, I think about that all the time. And the beginning of my long path of just discovering different kinds of people in the world was going from Indiana uh, the son of teachers, a relatively comfortable existence, and going to the uh, coal fields, the edge of the coal fields in eastern Kentucky, and a place where a lot of people had no education, and go to a university where every time at graduation they say, uh, if you're the first person in your family ever to graduate college, stand up, and half the class stands up, right? Uh, it's just a different kind of people, not better or worse, but different kind of people than the people I'd grown up with. And that challenged me, and I've been challenged ever since by different kinds of people, and I've tried, you'll tell me if I do a good job, but I've tried to embrace that and understand that, and the last couple of books have had two main characters who are very different kinds of people, and that's a deliberate effort to illustrate what I think America is, which is the push and pull between those of us who are different and have different backgrounds and different views. And I think it's in that interaction that we find our country. Thank you. Hi, Steve. Hi. Nice to see you. Um, so I want to know if it's a love story. It sort of is. I'm curious um, to hear about the relationship in the marriage. Although my mom was very disappointed in Mr. Fremont. By the way, Jesse, in her letters, would refer to him as Mr. Fremont. Mr. Fremont says... That's like Anna in Downton Abbey, Mr. Bates. Ah. Just saying. Very formal. Um, in a way, it's a love story. He uh, wrote, there, there is a quote from uh, what must have been a beautiful love letter that he wrote her when they were very young. Um, but in later years, the letters that survive, there is one in particular a uh, beautiful, longing love letter that she writes to him when he's way out west, and she has it sent west with a man to be deposited at this trading post, hoping that he will show up there on the way back. Um, there is not so much the other way. Um, and you have to remember that this is a guy who kept leaving home. Now, to an extent, we can understand that. It's his job, and it's many people's job. It's often my job to leave home. Uh, People who are in the military go away for many, many months at a time. It is many people's jobs to leave home. But he left a lot for very long periods of time. And she had to endure that. Um, and I think maybe that is ultimately why my mom decided that she loved him, but she wasn't sure that he loved her. Um, I think he loved her, but I also think that he was a guy who was... I don't want to say cracked, but just damaged in some way by the extreme adventures that he went through. He had these experiences that were very much like going to war, once it actually became a war. And uh, I don't want to diagnose him posthumously with PTSD, but he was a guy who could not stay in one place, could not stay rooted, had to keep moving. And one of the saddest moments in their life, actually, is he spent so much of their lives leaving here in the East and going West Finally, at the end of their lives, they moved to Los Angeles, California, and they were as far west as they could go, and they were together, and he decided it was time for him to go back east. <laughs> anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Hi, Steve. Hi there. Um, my wife and I wake up to you every morning. Thank you. And thank, thank you, very you much. for your being a mephilus. Uh, alarm clock for us. Thank you. I don't think I pronounced that right. Mellifluous mo mo alarm clock. You know no, it's good. No, you did it right. You did it right. You were right. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Um, were these two narcissists? And if they were, um, 
Is that the uh, road to success in America these days? Wow. Um, <laughs> wow. I hope not. That I hope that's not the road to success. Uh, there are some writers, and I'm not the first person ever to write about them. There have been a handful of biographies over a hundred and some years. Um, the, some writers have used the word narcissism, particularly about John, uh, and sort of diagnosed particular episodes where he seems to be acting in that kind of classical way. I'm reluctant to diagnose that just like I'm reluctant to diagnose PTSD. Uh, he certainly was ambitious, which can be good, sometimes all about himself, which can be bad, sometimes lost in his own head, which can be bad. Uh, she fit with him in some way. Uh, they certainly did grasp for fame and they certainly were uh, people who would make the story all about themselves. But if you had asked them, they would have said, and I think they would have sincerely believed that they were sacrificing for a cause larger than themselves because they believed in this narrative we were talking about before of westward expansion and of Americans molding a new character of, of freemen uh, as they struggled against the elements and struggled against the landscape of the American West. That is what Fremont, John Fremont himself believed he was doing and Jesse believed that she was aiding in her father's great vision. Last question. My name's Renee, and I'm an NPR fan. All right, thank um, you. Did are, I'm curious to know about the writing process. Uh, did you, you mentioned you're a Civil War junkie, uh, and the period running up to the Civil War is very interesting. So did you decide you were gonna write about that period and pick them because they were illustrative, or did you pick them? I think it's more the former. I was interested in the period. I had written this book called Jackson Land, uh, about Andrew Jackson and a Cherokee chief, John Ross, who battled against him for some 20 years. And that's an early phase of America's westward expansion, shoving Indians out of the way of the westward expansion of the country uh, and pushing them west of the Mississippi. That made me interested in the next phase of the story. And I began exploring that uh, story and did settle on them because I felt that they touch upon so much and symbolized so much that was modern, that was about now. Which also gets to my writing process because although NPR generously allowed me a couple of uh, short book leaves, like eight weeks, um, I was mostly writing while working or working while writing. And uh, having a story that was very different than the daily news and yet somehow reflected upon the daily news allowed my day job to influence my night job. Wait, they're both night jobs. <laughs> allowed my one job to influence the other job and, um, to, and, 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 vice, and vice versa. They were, for me, almost the perfect people because they are about the past but also about now. Thank you. Thank you. I had a closing comment. Oh, okay. okay. In the 60s, I read Irving Stone's Immortal Life. Ah, a novel, yes, yes. about Jesse. And it made me love history, so I am really looking forward to reading this and getting the story straight. Oh, yay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, just in closing, on this issue of their relationship, part of me felt like they both, I wouldn't say it was transactional, but they both went into it knowing that each of them would get something out of it that they couldn't otherwise yes. have gotten out yes. of it. Yes, yes. Aside from whatever love there was, they fit together and seemed to understand that. Jesse wanted to be her father's assistant, couldn't do that, but could do it through him. He wanted to rise in the world, didn't really have the connections, and she provided them. Yeah. There, yeah. It's really fascinating. I really learned a lot, and I encourage you all to buy it and read it and um, support this amazing writer oh, and this amazing bookstore also this bookstore yeah. and yeah. since I have a public media background if you are not members membership is important even for politics and prose um, and uh, it's a terrific book I'm really thank proud you. of you Steve and I'm proud to call you my friend thank you thank you very much thank you. Okay, so I guess I'll sign if anybody wants.